Hello everyone, today we talk about Henry de Fabler's 929 campaigns against the Slavs. I thought that the uh, Saxon Slavic frontier deserves a bit more of specific attention, in fact we'll come back on it. Probably we will look at Ottonian warfare also on the western frontier. I made up to this point just very basic, uh, kind of manualistic history videos about the Ottonians, the Ottonian Empire, uh, the Ottonian domination of other countries just recently we saw that a bit uh, in the section, in the relative section in the Duchy of Bohemia uh, video I made, a video about the Ottonian domination of, of Italy, um, the, uh, specifically the reigns of Otto I and Otto II. Um, so there is a general background I'm relatively satisfied of in, in interest of time, but we'll have to go much in uh, depth uh, about the military side of the story, right? Because this era really doesn't see any major, as you know, you can, uh, you you know, but by this time, telling the truth, that I, I stress all the time that technologistic prejudices are basically the first indicator of complete strategic literacy. This was the Ottonians didn't take over large parts of Europe because of any specific technological improvement or technical booming whatever. It was just that uh, old crude way of making war with the means of the time as we will see today the, the Saxons were also historically similar to to other people, such as the Franks or the same Western Slavs, uh, to a degree. Naturally, in Henry de Fabler's times, the Carolingian system had kicked in even in the relatively undeveloped and primitive uh, Saxony for these accomplishments, naturally, to, to, uh, to take off um, in that rapid fashion, but it, it gets down mostly to those basic political and social factors that eventually also in an imperial and military uh, direction uh, would make what, in fact, what we call the Holy Roman Empire, was actually the same Carolingian one, um, was, um, say, established, at least at this point, by the uh, the Saxon dynasty over uh, large parts of Central and Southern Europe and known, right, and as such, until until very late uh, in time. Uh, so I picked this year specifically because it illustrates uh, what you can see as a typical right, uh, set of, of campaigns on the eastern frontier with all the in fact, strategic, uh, tactical, logistical, operational, uh, incredibly violent you know, content that that you can imagine, right? It it's important as always before looking at history to make an effort into the uh, the mindset of these peoples uh, at the time. This is not actually the the right video to do so. At least we will. This will hopefully help. But just think about what what it actually means to to be in tenth century A.D in Central Europe, in places like, I don't know, on the Elbe Valley, right, or on the Havel Valley, or, uh, or in Bohemia. Like, the degree of, uh, of brutality, of um, primitiveness, of the, the, the mental structures, the, 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 the beliefs involved here. Um, the, um, the ambiguities uh, as a fr of a frontier, uh, of a frontier area, both from a political and um, a religious point of view, uh, the sense that the Ottonians that here are not yet uh, emperors, telling the truth, Henry is king of the Eastern Franks, is said famously to have refused uh, the Roman crown because um, the, the German one was enough for him. But here definitely there is... Um, an enormous ambition that uh, is uh, being forged on the on the basis of uh, encastellation. Henry de Flavler's uh, uh, accomplishments in this regard will be the basis for his son Otto to, to rise. In fact, imperial dignity. This is the case for all the um, main um, uh, houses. Uh, in Germany, and specifically the, in fact, the, the royal, the imperial ones, that all the, the fathers of all great rulers, like in this case Otto the First, 
um, uh, Frederick Barbarossa, etc., were all based on this very strong uh, militarized fort, mostly castles, right? Uh, and more, right? We cannot digress here on the sense of political compaction of the of the Saxons. Their um, their role as essentially a, a, a people that redeemed itself by being the single most traumatically and violently hammered down in the entire uh, Carolingian military history, but perhaps in part exactly for this reason, the one who would eventually uh, assume the same imperial dignity by themselves and even recover the, the full Romanity of the empire by, by titling. Um, again, made lots of videos on this, I will not uh, touch it again now, but um, just think this mentality, this ambition, this this prowess that was a real thing, because these expeditions were exactly the moment in which to, to demonstrate your own uh, valor in front of God, in front of the world, right, in front of the universe, right, and to prove that the, the Imperium, the Holy Ghost, w would descend on you to rule over uh, the the globe, um, and from the other side, the Western Slavs. I, I made a video just recently about them, and we will about them specifically observe some military aspects in in dedicated videos because they're uh, th this frontier is really one again one of the single most brutally bloody and violent that you can imagine in the Middle Ages. Also one of the single most important ones, especially we will not see it very much today, to only the truth, but in in uh, combination with the Magyar raids into far, far deep into Germany, that as you know is also a bit what triggers by uh, internal consensus the rise of uh, the um, the Saxons to uh, to the Eastern Frankish royalty. By the way, we are um, rightfully eager to point out the military success of Otto the First, but telling the truth. Battles like Riade or also the nameless ones that the barbarians were fighting uh, uh, on on the fore, right against the the, the the Magyars, have been a bit obscured by the later Ottonian imperial historiography, right? But a lot was being done at this point, and I think that these campaigns of 929 would illustrate also the the impressive degree of organization that they entailed. Um, aside from cooperation, but properly the level of uh, regional, you know, also properly strategic vision regarding what was from the other side, it definitely was was known, right? Today we lack naturally most of the sources regarding what the, the Slavic side was, um, a bit because they weren't Christianized uh, yet, but also because they were less developed uh, even than, than Eastern French. Uh, uh, but of course, that's what we see through through that m medium, right? But at the time, like uh, I don't know, the Dukes of Saxony, the the the, the, the Thuringians, the Bavarians would would know pretty relatively well. I mean, what would the Hevelians or the uh, the Lusatians or the Bohemians were to a degree that, of course, the would allow them to interfere in their own political. Affairs again. Here, it, there is a huge submerged, um, you know, uh, iceberg. Of course, that we, the the tip of which we c can barely uh, serve the purpose of illustrating this campaign today. But that, of course, is just like you see today's policy. How how complex international relations are. How endless. How you know, uh, how endless. Especially the debate, right? The the planning. The the gambling, the betting, right, investment. Uh, these are all things that we can barely reconstruct, but that are all contained. And the straightforwardness of the means here, because really the language between the Germans and the Slavs at this point was mostly the swords, sometimes even together, right, at a point under Otto I, as we've seen the Bohemians invade Thuringia, even managed to crush an Ottonian army. So do not, um, admittedly, these were the, say, the more powerful. Uh, especially of the neighbors, those who properly uh, bordered uh, eastern eastern France. But um, as we'll see now, the, the Slavs were pretty courageous, especially in defense, but not all. 
Um, so during the early 10th century, the Saxon Duke Otto, that is uh, uh, the progenitor of, in fact, of, of the Ottonian dynasty, who died in 912, and his son Henry the Fowler, that was Duke, in fact, of Saxony from 912 and King of Eastern Francia from 919 to 936, famously enough, began a series of campaigns with the objective of extending the Saxon rule north of the Middle Elbe, right, and east, especially of the Zala River, against the Heveli and the Dalemines. The latter were uh, Slavic peoples, and this was the, the nature of this frontier, right, the Elbe is a naturally important boundary. It's the one that the Romans set uh, at, at their conquest of Germany, um, the one that eventually, in, during the migration era, more or less, Martin will see now, the one between the, the Germans and the, the new coming uh, Slavs, and actually there was uh, an enormous continuity, also ethnically and demographic. Well, enormous maybe is, is too much, because objectively these eras went gravely uh, underpopulated uh, towards the end of the migration area, so the Slavs surely filled uh, well that gap, but continuously there had been um, inhabitants there, and in, in this space you can't quite even tell historically at some point who's actually a German, who's actually a Slav, um, especially the more you descend uh, in, in the lower uh, ranks, let's say, of politics uh, and society. But at this point the frontier is not entire like the the Elbe has uh like it flows in the north sea it has a relatively consistent direction obliquely from the northwest to, to the southeast upstream but in the various uh, and tortuous patterns that it takes especially the, its middle course uh was uh not really marking the uh the boundary between the Germans and the Slavs Right in in the areas that would become, in fact, as the the eastern the Ostmark, um, the Mark of Thuringia, right? Not as Thuringia was probably the German area that had also been settled by the Slavs. By the way, I made, I made as you know multiple videos about Thuringia just recently. Also, Franconia, where Slavs were also settled, etc. But this area specifically, uh, so the one that, as we will see now, was further colonized by the Ottonians with the the, the, the establishment of Meissen. Right, that's mostly the 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 most important center uh, up to, in fact, um, Bohemia. If you, if you go upstream, um, think about Nimburg, etc. Uh, we'll see all now because they were already very important fortified um, settlements that have a lot to do with this campaign. Were in the hands of the Slavs, right? So the only actual band, let's say, the only actual trade of, of um, separation that the Elbe made between the Germans and the Slavs was loosely the one that ran from the Lüneburg to roughly uh, Magdeburg, right? Then before you had in the north, the you have Holstein, um, etc. That is already uh, Germanic. Uh, then further south. Uh, it's still prevalently Slavic. So this, uh, of course, geopolitics does not exist, in case you didn't know, uh, and this is yet another proof of it, that is to say that the river, per se, do, did not make what the, the historical settlement, the historical frontier between the, uh, at least the border between the, the Germans and the Slavs. But it was important to secure it in that very hard work of the Buchanan, already called of Ost Zidlung, um, in the consolidated the foundation of like permanent uh, infrastructure, evangelization, establishment of churches and castellation, so the compaction of these territories um, uh, under a very stable, permanent, irregimented pattern, right of territorial uh, control. Uh, of which the Ottonians, of course, are also some of the best. Um, examples at this time, uh, given that uh, consolidating this position meant to secure the, uh, their, own, their own eastern frontier, not just the eastern Frankish one, but the one of their ancestral Saxony. So uh, the land of, uh, of what would become the land of the Billungs, uh, Eastphalia, right? These are 
the uh, the lands of frontier were suffering historically from uh, Slavic raids. I mean, Charlemagne himself, in order to uh, to subjugate the Saxons, allied himself first with the Slavs, and then, of course, when he uh, you know established himself uh, in the land, um, had to to launch raids against them uh, as well. And so it's a sort of belt running from the Baltic Sea to, to Bohemia and, and beyond, because it goes further south, border with the Magyars, so especially at this point, had already began to destruct the raids into, into the eastern part of the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. So properly uh, Saxony, Thuringia, uh, Bavaria, these were the lands that, uh, at, at, during the 10th century, did risk to be destabilized to the point of non-return by the Hungarian invasion. This is particularly important to stress and very overlooked because uh, the stabilization instead of the of the Germanic frontier and it's even uh, further pushed towards the east was a major factor of stabilization of the, the further of, of the broader Frankish Roman uh, space, right? And so the one of Western civilization. In a, in a narrower uh, sense, that would come to include the same Slavs, especially in the West, turned part of their land, such as these ones, right? Um, so already at the time of Louis the German, Eastern Frankish king uh, of of the in fact of the ninth century, the uh, campaigns uh, from um, Saxon to the Slavic lands had uh, been going on quite consistently. The Carolingian forces had historically the upper hand. They were just the expression of a more advanced civilization. They had um, what is reductive to call massive logistical apparatus that the Carolingians, um, and even early before the Merovingians, had been working. It dated in part even on the Rhine back to the time of the, you know, the settlement of the Roman legions. It was something enormous that allowed the Carolingian military machine to systematically subjugate this enormous amount of land. Um, and um, they, their society was consistently richer and more stratified, so that it was better suited for probably a hierarchical uh, and uh, disciplined uh, uh, conduction of military operations with a core of de facto professional um, fighters that at this point are starting to be called the militas, making up properly a, a military class on their own. This is slightly less visible in Eastern Francia compared, say, to, to the West, um, uh, or even the South at a point, because uh, Germany had the single least stratified uh, society of uh, the the Carolingian, uh, of the former Carolin Carolingian Empire. But, of course, uh, these militas, um, even if for, for, for their per capita wealth, or if it had been, this is another thing we will see today, the, the much mm, less... Uh, cavalry suited, let's say, uh, terrain of Central Europe that was still largely covered in forests and swamps uh, in spite of the previous uh, Frankish colonization was still progressing through the same military operations uh, tended to fight uh, a bit more on on foot, right? But still, right, mounted, uh, mounted combat was the, the old mark of these um, uh, of these Carolingian successors, uh, also in, in Saxon. These Slavs had another profile. They were even less socially stratified than the Germans. Uh, they were poorer. They had a level, uh, a lesser level of political cohesion. Um, but this was likely being accelerated in relative terms by the same methods of stilts, by the same threat deterrence posed by by Eastern Francia that, of course, saw her natural uh, boundaries uh, to, to expand in as a sort of Far East. And that especially was pagan, or it was yet to be Christianized, and so the level of sheer destruction, exploitation, enslaving, uh, massacring, and, and so on, um, was just 
more tolerated by international institutions. Like the West was in theory more remunerative, but it was again uh, against tougher enemies. So um, there was still much of that um, Carolingian legacy being played on. Um, you know, Henry himself had been born where the Carolingian Empire still existed, so that they were they had also very high connections. So they all felt very much, and we have observed this in multiple videos. This sense that. In spite of the absence of a capable um, emperor to, to reunite the world, it was a common, uh, uh, a common identity uh, that had been formed by the throughout all the Carolingian, the post-Carolingian at this point um, land, right? Um, so there were opportunity, just a bit like for how it had been by, for, for, the, for the Franks against the Saxons, right? These lands in the east were cruder, um, less remunerative, and somehow even tougher to, 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 to subjugate directly. But once this would have been accomplished, right? Their stabilization was uh, more secure, right? Because it could really be worked from the foundations of it up. Uh, and as it would happen, in fact, given that most of these territories are today's, you know, part of Germany and they were for, um, from the Middle Ages and, and part from this very uh, year, um, we can appreciate the, the, the general success of Right, so uh, that there weren't many choices, telling you the truth, just uh, like for the Carolingians against the Saxons. Uh, these peoples in the East had been harassing the greater powers since ever, because that's what uh, the, the peoples who live at the outskirts of great powers do. They do not have the same power, in fact, and the only way to, to compete with it is hoping to exploit any weakness, right, so they can capitalize upon this uh, contingent uh, success, hoping to accumulate wealth that is not going to even hope that one day the, the, your country can be wiped out, but that it's still the only, the faster way to progress in, in the face of this looming threat that, you know, at some point is going to strike you. So it was an incredibly vicious uh, theater to fight in, as we'll appreciate now. These labs especially were fanatic defenders historically, right? Uh, the, we, we've seen this in basically in all the videos we made about early and high medieval Slavic history. That the Slavs would basically entrench themselves in their uh, Fluchtburgen, as are, they are called in, in, in archaeology. Um, they were or in the mountains, or in the swamps. This is something that the, the, the Germans themselves had been doing, say, at the time, I don't know, of, of, of the Roman Empire, or stuff like that. Um, and it would hold Right, doesn't matter. Uh, like, it does matter, of course, how long. But you know, they were able to endure tremendous pain and suffering, um, constantly harassing the bulkier armies of their uh, opponents until the the attrition would force the latter to at least abandon the theater. But in this case, still to have inflicted so much damage to to the local system to make the local rulers basically accepting the at least formal subordination of their uh, power to the broader, in this case, the, the Germanic one. We, we've seen it just again the other day in the video about the Duchy of Bohemia, how it was formed and so on. So um, war is nothing but the continuation of politics uh, with other means. And this is exactly what the Ottonians were seeking. It was not even about maintaining necessarily these strongholds. Rather, that was also the purpose. But more than else, simply controlling, guiding, co-opting the Western Slavic elites to gradually integrate them um, in their own in their own domains. Right. So an incredibly again attritional and costly uh, endeavor that, especially when you can, we will see now there, there were general levies, for example, throughout the entire Saxony. There was a pretty consistent amount of troops that would be mobilized in. in 10th century Europe in this essentially provincial dimension, like you, you can you can measure pro the effort, right? These the, the Saxons themselves were not very far away from their tribal past, from this again incredibly uh, hard time where you, as we were saying before, respond just to the 
um, to the possibilities of the demographic and agricultural cycles. Your life is like that, that politics is dictated largely by these factors, the availability of troops, the, the capacity of, saying, resisting the Carolingian conquest for, for a given while and then eventually collapsing um, in accepting the new rule. So, um, in, also incredibly painful histories, as you realize, but this is also how Europe, our Europe, uh, was forged, and in my opinion, for, for the better, because the outcome of this effort was still providing with a greater sense of 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 of, of, val of universal value uh and and what this meant from a practical point of view um so the again the slavic habit of protecting the populations from invading armies and entrenching in their uh fortified uh uh, hilltops uh or other well, scattered around there was also this this other problem that where 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 is the frontier here right not even germany has an eastern frontier evidently it never existed historically um the, what's the slavic one right you know you have to reach the steps or not even because even the world of the forest but we're talking about enormous amount of land right sparsely populated poorly connected poorly productive but enormous extension amount of of land um, that have still all to be worked right to to reach uh, some degree of civilization remember these are not areas that have ever known cities historically right that they lived in a completely different um world to 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 different degree even from peoples that lived a few hundreds of kilometers away so um it's the the formamentus that i'm asking you for for a for an instance to 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 make the fort of of uh picturing has to do concretely with this and you would be sur you would or wouldn't be surprised by how how true this is for the world still today right how we give for granted especially from a western perspective what it, say what it means to just have a uh, uh, say a broader horizon in, in in many ways and and how much of this was built over the ages to a point where this awareness was mostly a just a spiritual one not really a um a factual kind of you know uh, uh, awareness of the entirety of the system you assuming for that that this would have been a better would be a better thing because uh, as you know there was also a completely different way of cultivating your own moral forces at the time that make uh makes our own you know ridic appearing ridiculous today to say the least um in any case um when we look at archaeology of of this frontier we'll realize something striking that is to say these fluchtburgen of the slums were built exactly in the moment in which the Saxon invasions during the late 9th and early 10th century had occurred. In fact, the enterochronological dating of the wooden ramparts that basically made up mostly the the the, the, wall, the walls, right, the, the, the structure of, of the entire burg, um, such as, for example, the ones in Lower Lusatia, uh, demonstrate that at least nine substantial fortresses were built this specific uh, area around the beginning, uh, in fact, the end of the 9th, the beginning of the 10th century, and further 7 by 960, right? And the uh, enormous effort here, socially and economically, is, is clear, right? These Slavs had never had to do anything like this ever in their history before, right? So this massive, say we're talking about these Western Slavs, um, this specific context, were um, were uh, essentially under an unprecedented pressure, right? Uh, necessity of defending themselves like never before. And evidently, the Saxon intentions were quite clear, right? And also, you can imagine the consequences that we will observe now. Now, looking at 929... Henry the Fowler started his campaign early in the year, 
king of eastern France, mobilized a very large army made up of the militas and the exercitus. This is the terminology used by Widukind, uh, the uh, Saxon uh, historian, uh, in his Res Geste. Um, he differentiates between exercitus and, and the militas um, as basically and respectively the general levy uh, and the, uh, the ducal retinue, practically, the household of the Saxon dukes um, and then King Henry. This uh, division is pretty natural. I mean, the Saxon military at this point was made up by, as we were saying, that uh, hardcore of the, not just the ducal, but say, generally speaking, the nobility are now, for how it starts affirming itself as a, as a concept, retinues. So men that were leaving as, as were technically the bodyguards of the uh, of the various uh, Saxon uh, aristocrats that could be regularly maintained, paid to fight, right, professionally. Thus, um, the levy being the traditional uh, Germanic uh, universal, actually, because it existed all over Europe. Um, uh, in fact, uh, mobilization of an expeditionary force that, for which, in theory, every single um, uh, able-bodied freeman, but not only, right, also their their serfs uh, uh, on occasion could be um, could be called to participate, right. Uh, naturally, there was a rota system regarding the latter. Uh, we don't have to think literally everybody being ever mobilized historically at any given point uh, in time. Uh, but still, the the amount of these people for which others had to remain home, work in the fields, and so on, was um, was an enormous cost for the uh, local population. And this army was um, massive, right, for... Saxon standards. It was essentially an expeditionary force for a campaign of conquest that was directed to capture, in this case, the main political centers of um, these two peoples, the Abelli at uh, Brandenburg, basically, and the Daleminzi, as are called uh, in the uh, sources, that is basically the Sorbs, right? Um, so there are one in the north, one in, in the south. Uh, the latter are uh, the ones that was telling you mostly inhabiting what would become the East Mark, and the Mark of Thuringia. Uh, the uh, the Avellians, uh would eventually be incorporated in what was known as the North Mark, right? Just to give you the, the coordinates. But not only, right? Uh, the Dalamenses. Um, Centre was the one of Ghana or Yana, the location of which we'll see now. Um, but also the Bohemians at Prague, right? And you know that that was already the, the largest centre uh, in Bohemia. Uh, it had been uh, rising fast since the, the decline of the of um, of great Mor- so-called Great Moravia that in fact. Uh, was just uh, shortly defunct by, by this point with the arrival uh, of the Magyars. And so were the greatest, um, say, uh, Western Slavic power along the, the frontier, probably the contact with Eastern Francia would be a devil, right? And the, and the Duchy of Bohemia and the, the later kingdom as the future members of the same Holy Roman Empire. Right parts even of the electoral college and so on. There is an entire medieval Bohemian history that if you're interested in uh, the thing. Um, so the first stage of the campaign, as we said, was at Brandenburg and it culminated in the capture of the relative fortress by storm. Right, the fate of the um, occupants was quite clear. Widukind says that the uh, settlement was taken by iron, ferro, 
uh, ablative in, in Latin. Um, so the, the the fortress was captured and the defenders at least was were, were massacred. Right. So this was uh, just it tells you how straightforward the thing was. Brandenburg is on on the on the Hava River, the importance of which we'll see now, because basically originates uh, further north in the Uckermark. We'll talk about later, and then it makes a sort of circle. It goes south, then west, and there is Brandenburg. And in this area, there are, let's say, that the river is wider, and there are also some marshes and so on. Then it goes up again uh, towards the northwest, and it flows um, in uh, at Berben, basically, um, the Prislava, uh, in Havelberg, almost right. Havelberg is slightly upstream, um, but in the Elb, right? So the strategic importance of, of Brandenburg was already evident as the main center of the valley and basically Saxon just takes this take this thing by storm right we can imagine that there will be some tactical detail about um, the other uh, the other operations but as you understand like throughout all medieval warfare and this is perhaps a bit underappreciated people because of on the wake of the military revolution, always say, ah, oh, infantry was so important for sieges, it's overlooked, etc. Yes, but the, even more overlooked than that is the role of the men-at-arms, right, of the militas in this case, because those are the true stormtroopers, right? The the infantrymen, like the, the, the levy infantry, let's say, would be useful to create a... Um, to, to enclose the settlement, right, to form a barrier so that it the, the the center could not be supplied from the external. You need lots of men all around, and that's what they do. But the actual troops that storm the fortifications, these are the heavies. These are guys that have enough wealth um, power to be to afford, as we were saying before, to to train their entire lives. They are very athletic, they're very tough. They are people just that have, on average, you know, slaughtered surely tens of people uh, uh, without much of a problem, by the way, and that basically do only that their, their entire life, right? And they they have the level of athleticism, the level of physicality, and but especially moral load, and so they have seen, greatly speaking, this all before, to, to rise, to climb uh, the ladders, to, to storm uh, in, in, the, in the breaches, to... to uh, do this as fast and effectively as possible with the support of the lighter troops that must um, possibly suppress the enemies on the ramparts. So we're talking about archery having a great importance in here because most of the other troops are all de facto unarmored, uh, if not for some some bad clothing. But uh, we know that, say, also in that case, what matters there is is increasing the level of offensive capacity, not much the defensive one even if you want the defense. Um, and, you know, with stones, logs, stuff that would arrive from the above, javelins, um, but effectively taking the place, letting the other troops in, and making a bloodbath. Right? This is what these people, we think, well, oh my god, it's so terrible. It, I don't know how to, to break it down to you, but this is the only thing they did. In their, it was completely normal. It was not... Uh, it was seen as a terrible thing, bloodshed, etc. It was a huge deal. I made lots of videos about um, the Christian, you know, penalties, uh, the penitentials, uh, you know, what we can draw about military uh, information from them, etc. But this is the only way you have uh, to storm a place. And uh, this is like slaughtering the defenders if they have opposed themselves, because normally we're, they were given the, the opportunity at least to, to give up. Um, notoriously brought to massacre, right? When people also make all start whining because I don't know the Crusaders killed everybody in Jerusalem, or you know even uh, at the you know during the Albigensian Crusade, the, the famous statement, you know, just kill them all. You know, God will recognize their own. Because obviously, you know, you cannot defend a place if you do not have the decisive moral support of the of the even of the population inhabits there. So those who were defending weren't necessarily just the poor victims again now how oh, the common people do not want war this is this is the, possibly one of the single most radically uh, stupid idea that for some reason the lesser people need to believe nowadays still to flatter themselves because of their own personal favor right uh, 
reality does not work like that. Politics does not work like that, right? Be, war doesn't work like that. Be sure of that. Um, and um, this is what regularly these people, the Slavs, do with one another. Uh, the there, there's plenty of examples of that also archaeologically. Look at the origins of Lübeck, for example. Um, this is what the Germans do with one another. This is the only way to make the the damn thing, right? W what is striking here is how, you know, well, well, um, well played, you know, such uh, storming was, and how ambitious the entire campaign really was, because it was just th this was seen as a as a foretaste, right? Um, as an entree, not even, um, and in theory, the, even this expedition could go wrong just per se because you can't simply say well, okay we march there we simply take over the place where right? it could be that you load um, uh, your army so much that you're able to storm it but everything can technically go wrong you can't be bogged down somebody can't send uh, reinforcements uh, the weather can't go terribly wrong um, you may have underestimated uh, just the enemy resistance for other things you were taking care of to organize the dual thing so this is the first step and after this Henry leaves a garrison at Brandenburg and he continues um, his campaign towards the settlement of Jana, that is Ghana, and it's a place um, basically just south of Strela on the uh, Elbe. Um, the location is um, it's just it's, it's actually distant from the river. This was the most important um, stronghold of the Dalemins. Uh, that thus had to be taken. Consider that Brandenburg and the Havel is 85 kilometers east of Magdeburg, which is the place where the Saxon army had assembled. So you, you can cover this distance in three days, it's not a big deal. Even considering the communications of the time, that's actually how long uh, any army takes. Right? It's not, uh, there was no real difference between the Middle Ages and the other years in terms of how fast armies uh, marched. Um, you would be surprised at times of how fast these distances could be covered. Here admittedly there is no like major valley, whatever. When you go towards um, Yana you um, are following the Elbe, uh, but it's a much longer distance. Um, you will follow the the river banks that are flat um, in the general area is not particularly rugged in the first place, but along the river. It's easier, you can't supply the army with boats, um, so that's why uh, Magdeburg had been so important um, in the process. Uh, and it works as a sort of extension, right, as a sort of forward defense of the Ottonian capital, it was Magdeburg uh, itself. right? So you understand immediately from the location of, of Saxon power how crucial the just basically the attachment to the very to the very frontier uh, on on uh, the very boundary of the Elbe really was to just march uh, further east and also not just that right you know this was also in in the south of Saxony so it could easily make you reach uh, Thuringia even Bavaria uh, Franconia uh, albeit for the latter were also uh, better routes uh, further west, but we're not seeing now the, po the political geography of Saxony um, just per se, right? Uh, Brandenburg uh, now conquered, controlled the axis, as we've seen, to the half, uh, to the lower reaches of the Elbe, thus um, the, the same North Sea together with it consolidating properly the entire um, river net communication. Uh, on on the river that as we've seen especially north uh, formed the, the direct border with um, with the Vilsians, with the, the Polabians uh, etc uh, from uh, an offensive perspective uh, such fortress was evidently conquered by Henry for being able to to campaign not just towards the south as he would do now, but
but also towards the east, right along the Havel, towards the Oda River, because the the Havel is basically just halfway, right? At least in the in the per, the north south part, um, the, the lands of the Ukrainians, uh, etc., between the the Elbe and the Oda. So um, this entirely the, this land would be part of the north mark right towards the north it would be the, the mark of the buildings but um it's essentially a, a relatively complex space between the two rivers it is yet another buffer area that you can uh consolidate and that makes will make up effectively the, the, the border with pomerania with, with poland further further east right so the strategic value of Brandenburg under Havel is evident as much as uh, rapid its economic uh, the, the economic development of, of the settlement where a bishopric was established by the Ottonians in 946 after his capture of Brandenburg Henry quote Signa vertit contra dalla mancia. Right, that is to say, he turned his banners towards uh, dalla mancia, um, as um, Vidukind himself writes. The distance here is consistently longer, takes essentially a week. It's 180 kilometers from Brandenburg. As the crow flies, by the way, so likely more. Uh, substantially more uh, on the medieval paths. This fortress of Jana uh, may have been constructed at the modern site of Stauchitz, that is 10 kilometers south uh, of the Elbe. Uh, we do not know exactly whether it's the same place because that's also what happened at this point. These settlements were uh, not necessarily permanent, but war could uh, destroy it, and or like, but even just in, for, because of internal political struggles, right? So uh, there are lots of these fortresses that simply ruined in also in close times to, to these ones, even not because of specific destruction, right? It's a different type of settlement compared to the more established. Uh, cities, even the the ones who were essentially emerging, mostly as towns um, uh, rather than cities in the in non-Roman Germany uh, at that point, um, that however would have a more permanent faith. According to Vidukind, uh, Henry besieged Jana for twenty days, right, before finally capturing also this fortress that was the center of the Dalemanenses political power. Also in this case the garrison was slaughtered. We know of youths and girls taken as slaves from the same res gesta Vidukind. Um, this is also interesting because again these were pagan Slavs, so they literally had uh, a much lower value on the market than than an Eastern, a Christian Eastern Frank, um, and they could be sold simply as slaves. This was like we're talking about the Viking Age. Uh, there was a florid slave market uh, in Northern Europe. The Christians naturally were forbidden to enslave other, other Christians, but as far as these guys were concerned, especially in such a, a remote frontier. Um, from the perspective of civilization, well, these things could go on uh, pretty smoothly and brutally, uh, as you can imagine here. So this is yet another major feat, right? 180 kilometers covered likely in, in a week, um, 20 days of siege. We can say that in another month, Henry manages to subdue yet another major provincial chunk. Again, before the largely what would be the the north mark or almost uh, half of it um here say if not properly the the what would become the east mark um still the, the one that would be known as the one of thuringia right um 
from the from this side of the Alp compared to to Germany. So it's it's yet another clamor success. Here we have to imagine twenty days of siege uh, spent at you know spotting the the weaker point of the defenses, creating uh, military machines, uh, digging in. Uh, surrounding the the settlement, blockading any uh, possibility of, of supplying it from the external, and um, a fall, right? That maybe happened after you know uh, severe fighting uh, in a war or another. The Eastern Frankish king at this point begins the uh, the construction of a replacement for Jana. Because he didn't see this differently from Brandenburg as a convenient place where to establish the center of, of the land. This, this had previously worked for, we do not know exactly for which political reason. And that's how Meissen is founded, um, 25 kilometers southeast on the Elbe. Mm-hmm. Uh, at a fort that controlled the main route towards uh, Lusatia and then to Bohemia, which is where the Ottonian was heading with this campaign, right? And we have the endochronological dating for the wooden structures at Meissen, which tell us that the construction happened exactly in 929, right? So confirming fully the sources that, by the way, are actually very and highly reliable against uh, the usual prejudices. Same are the narrative sources. Narrative sources are some of the most, uh, actually, first of all, the single most important ones that exist in absolute terms compared to any other in this context. Secondly, uh, of course, extremely reliable. Right? What do you think these people wrote for? Right? Where, where does this paranoid, conspiratorial, weak brain comes from? Right? In terms of, you know, that there is a conspiracy about how, how people were making up history. Why did people m- write history, according to you, in the first place? To fabricate an alternative reality in a world where people, generally speaking, did this new things in the first place. Right? Just... Just some alienated, hallucinated people can think that history is the usual thing is written by the terrible winners, as if there was something wrong in winning, by the way, in a civilizational sense. Um, or that, you know, everybody has this is this evil... Per- the, the, the most evil part of society are the people, right? These are actually some of the most intelligent individuals that existed at the time that could write this thing. Um, and it turns out that everything is extremely reliable, but this is not just because of the dendrochronological date, right? We we knew that this was then under 29 um, anyway. Um, so the interesting aspect, if anything, of this information that we get uh, from the from the analysis of of the uh, wooden structures is that the Saxons began to build the fortress at Meissen in the same time in which Henry went on um, with his campaign, right? So obviously he had left there somebody to take care of the matter, to immediately fortify this place that had been chosen just in, in a relatively short time to be the better one where to find um, a such, you know, a relatively important center historically, like, like Meissen, that would give, it would remain, in fact, the, the, the center of, of, of the mark, of the homonymous, the, the homonymous mark. The final phase of Henry's uh, campaign, that, by the way, here, I, I didn't say this, but it, it started in winter. So this is yet another interesting aspect of the thing. But by now, um, we, I can't think, was already beginning to, uh, like, to, to spring. But we do not know exactly, right, when this started. But uh, it would go on for a substantial amount of time. So they thought to probably surprise uh, the Slavs early in the year, 
as far as the the, cons the conquest the consolidation of these two um, uh, centers was concerned um, so also to prevent a general mobilization of 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 in fact of the Slavs from elsewhere, right, and arriving in you know good time for the for a warmer weather, but in Central Europe still uh, this was relatively early, right? Consider that uh, Charlemagne normally started in May, right? It, uh, normally March where was uh, the beginning of of the military season in places like Italy. Right in the south, um, so the sense here was a sort of um, not necessarily a blitzkrieg in you know tactical sense, but because uh, of course you have to stop besieging and storming uh, the places, but still, you know, like in a strategic sense, it was meant to take by if not completely by surprise, but still you know playing on the say the, the general weakness and political division and say general difficulty that uh, moving an army in, in winter would uh, would be the case for, for the Slavs, right? Um, who could also fight in winter themselves, but say winter campaigns are uh, rel just relatively rare, telling the truth. If you study medieval warfare, you realize how, say, not not particularly frequent, but how feasible it was, right? It was just a worse time in which to do it. It would cost more, it would have greater limitations, but um, it, say, the snow or cold, per se, did not really stop military operations uh, in, a, in a general sense. So, Prague was the ultimate um, target, Together, however, with, as we'll see now, the impressive set of fortresses that surrounded her. Prague is 230 kilometers south of Meissen, right? So this uh, distance can be covered in, say, 10 days, optimally. Um, the, uh, this, we're talking about the Old Tower left tributary uh, of the Alps, so you have basically to descend into the heart of Bohemia, you don't just head to Prague, right? Which is already a massive uh, settlement per se, right? It had uh, a circuit of walls measuring 1,200 meters, encompassing six hectares uh, of uh, area, right? Within its double fortification, right? You have. Levi Gradic and Visegrad that um, stand in the way. Levi Gradic was built on the Ultava River as well, nine kilometers north of Prague. And it was approximately the same size as Prague uh, at the moment of Henry's campaign. Uh, it uh, included a fortified area of six and a half hectares. Visegrad was built instead just south of the Prague walls, and like this Prague, Visegrad was a double fortress constructed on a steep hill with circuit of walls measured around thirteen hundred meters. Right, so these were again natural hilltops with a substantially large plateau that could be fortified with normally again also a different uh, just a, a multiple uh, ring of walls but also at a, at a difference in height so that it would be of course more complicated even for those who managed to storm the first circuit um, to just uh, mount up an assault against the, uh, the one above and again, they were loaded with um, people that were um, essentially sheltered these places together with their cattle and so on at the time of the enemy attacks. It naturally were devastating, raiding, uh, causing as 
much damage, especially in such uh, faraway places that were not to be, uh, were, were no, not to be um, controllable after um, the campaign uh, directly. So, you know, just the, the, it was good to weaken um, the, the enemy, uh, even in uh, if he was capable, in fact, of sheltering such large amount of resources um, in uh, in this uh, in in this fortifications, because it, it still was actually the the purpose of the entire campaign, not just the loot per se, but the the sheer damage you would cause to the entire system. I mean, entrenching oneself uh, is not a proof of strength. Right, you do that when you lose the the initiative, and so you just can hope to to resist in this atrocious um, defense that is surely quite effective because the Germans have great trouble like to storm this other um, this larger um, fortification. But these are, on the other hand, literally the the heart of say substantial powers like the the Bohemian one. Now, Widukind stresses how Henry the Fowler arrived at Prague, cum omni exercitu, right? Uh, which is, as we've seen, the Saxon monk's term for the expeditionary levy. What he meant specifically is that the Saxon army had not, um, say, uh, been uh, say the the, the 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 larger number of it had not uh, abandoned the expedition, so these troops, as we were saying before, were needed specifically to surround to blockade the enemy uh, settlements during the siege. Plus, we know from the Annales Ratis Bonensis, so the Annals of uh, Regensburg, that. The Bavarian Duke Arnulf, who ruled between 907 and 937, joined Henry's Saxon troops with his own national contingent. Uh, this, of course, tells us that the uh, the entire campaign had been planned uh, in co uh, combination with with the Bavarians, um, capturing. Prague, Visegrad, and Levi Radic in the, you know, at least, um, or the capacity just to besieging them and reducing, like, you know, hammering um, hard uh, the Bohemians um, would require very large forces indeed. It was worth it to just affirm Eastern Frankish power on, on this Western Slavic one. The numbers of the forces are unknown. Uh, we can see, however, that the importance of the expedition was consistent also with the uh, type and quantity of enemy that they had to counter. Right? Uh, we can conjecturally say that uh, Prague, Levigradic, and Visegrad, because of the perimeters that they had um, to defend, uh, would necessitate at least of 3,000 men, all right? And when we look at the Eastern Frankish expedition, the fact that there were Saxon, and Bavarians, and even, even Thuringian contingents, we can appreciate um, surely that um, an, adv um, an needed advantage of, say, one, uh, say, five to, to one, etc., of the attackers uh, over the defenders was, was probably met. Right, this was a very large expedition, um, enlarged by this uh, reinforcement. So we can estimate this force in fifteen thousand, uh, at least. There may have been more, but it's a bit difficult, right, for this to have been more. Right, it's um, admittedly, say, twenty thousand, even twenty-five thousand wouldn't be uh, impossible, right? But it would have been also a large strain. Um, the main problem here, the, the objective, let's say, was not necessarily to conquer those places. That would have been uh, not tenable, right? On the um, even on the medium run. So 
the um, the point was just to oppress so much the Bohemians to convince them not to try the thing again. Because also storming the, the settlements it would have been a, a bloodbath in many ways. So it doesn't matter how uh, much the Germans had the upper hand in open field. Generally, um, this this um, siege warfare just had to be considered uh, in terms of just making political pressure rather than through this the military instrument rather than simply storming the centers uh, that were much larger as uh, we have seen than than Brandenburg or Jana right um, uh, how does this expedition culminate? Well, in fact, with mission accomplished, because Wenceslaus I, that is ruling Bohemia, we've seen it uh, in, the, in the video about the duchy um, between 929 and 935, as Rex, right, um, decides to uh, essentially uh, surrender and accept the Eastern Frankish king Dizio, so the um, recognizing his own authority, his rule, rather than risking the same siege, or more likely to see the walls, even of, of, of even just one of these fortifications stormed, because, of course, the Bohemian nobility may have resisted, but still disqualified Vance's last um, as a ruler if too much damage had been inflicted. So this um, this is literally how it ends. Right? It may seem disappointing, but it's really not because once you understand the political objective, you realize that this was mission accomplished. But it's not over for 929. This time, however, it was Henry who had to cope with um, an, an enemy offensive in the summer of the same year. The threat came from the people of the Redari, who inhabited the area between the Lower Elbe and the Oda, their main center being Retra, if I'm not wrong, uh, from which they took the name of Redarians. Um, they had the, the Ukrians in the south. Uh, in, the, in the east, you know, on the Oda, you have Gars, um, Stettin, right? In the north, you have the Pena River. Um, in any case, uh, this is yet another uh, Western Slavic population that uh, uniquely was worried about the Saxon uh, intervention uh, in, um, in the lands of the Abelians, and especially of the conquest of Brandenburg. It could open to uh, further German operations towards the, the north following the Havel upstream and, in fact, arriving uh, in their land. So, uh, in July or early August 929, a major force of Redari launches an assault on the eastern Frankish fortress of Valsleben. That is uh, located, actually, across the Elbe River. Right? It's... Um, it's uh, actually in land even of places like Verben or Prislava that we were talking about before. This is, so this is a good example of, of the offensive capacities of the Slavs. These were, um, by the way, not uh, raiders. Uh, they had put together a consistent army, right, moving it in, in this area that today is basically corresponding to the Kreis of Stendhal, some 22 kilometers west southwest of the same fortress at Affelberg, which was sited uh, at the confluence of the Elbe and Havel rivers. So quite a strategic um, knot, as as you realize. This was, um, you know, a matter of most urgent. Uh, uh, importance because from one side you would have the Slavs literally entering your own territory so challenging the not just the the, uh, the Saxon uh, uh, the ducal Saxon authority but also the one of the the Eastern Frankish king as, as a wall so 
uh, discredited him in front of the entire realm, right? Attacking him in his own very ancestral land. Uh, and just, you know, this was true for the, you know, uh, as a show in front of the Saxon nobility uh, that so his, uh, their, their lands um, ravaged and things like that. So Henry dispatches a very large force of Saxon troops, including the military households of the magnates Bernhard and Tiatmar, as well as the Saxon general levy, the Exercitus. The objective, capturing the uh, Slavic fortification at Lenzen, located across the Elbe River on the on the right bank, some eighty five kilometers northwest of the same Valsleben. So this strategic choice is sound because um, definitely the Slavs have been quite bold in doing what they were doing. Um, they realized now the Rodarians had the the upper course of the Havel and and just the Elbe, so this territory in between to separate them from from the Saxons. And Lenzen is basically the most important fortress laying literally in, in this space, in this area. Um, it borders also with the Polabians, so it, it's, um, it's an important settlement that even at the, the Saxons so closer to home, but not excessively. I mean, 85 kilometers is not just nothing, but um, at least they can uh, here maneuver with much uh, closer bases. As Lenzen is actually just um, a few tens of kilometers away from the Elbe itself. So from the other side you have uh, again mostly the Lunenburg uh, places like Salzwedel uh, etc. In the south again at the confluence between the the Havel and, and the Elbe it's, it's 85 kilometers but generally speaking the um, Saxon supply lines are definitely much less stretched than the Slavic ones. So Henry, um, you know, obliges the Slavs at least to care right, in losing a territory that um, is actually more in, in land, right? Um, even scarcely so, but let's say considering the, the, the powers of the Rodarians compared to, to, to the Dutch of Saxony as a whole, right? If if these guys were trying to do something against Valsleben, but you know what chances did they have, like to eventually maintain it on the longer run? It seems like a, a desperate uh, move from from the Slavic side. Yet, right, it, it's still uh, to be appreciated in in courage. Um, here, the involvement of Bernard and Tietmar um, as powerful Saxon. Magnates together with the retinues is, is remarkable because it, the the fact that the enemies had stepped into Saxony still was um, a way for Henry to make more political leverage to oblige and powerful rulers to just invest their own resources for the good of of the land and so at least uh, reducing part of their power in favor of, of the Duke of one. So the Saxon force was prepared for a lengthy siege of Lenzen, by the way. In other words, they were even, in theory, okay with um, leaving uh, the Slavs attacking Valsleben, uh, as long as they could capture this this, uh, this fortification north that they uh, likely wanted since the beginning to, to maintain once once captured. Uh, we know that uh, the Saxons had uh, substantial supplies, including the tents. Like this is obvious for any expedition, but we find it in Vidukind, uh, res gesta di tentoria, uh, in Latin. So the Saxons arrived uh, at Lenzen on August the thirtieth. Consider that August the 30th in, in northern Germany is, uh, say, you can say, advanced, uh, you know, uh, uh, season, uh, but uh, it, it can't get colder fast. So the Tentoria are, you know, maybe referring specifically to this, the avenience that, that the siege could last 
substantially long in anticipation also of a coldening of the weather. Um, at this point, Tiathmar and Bernard establish a regular fortified camp, uh, uh, the Castra, um, and posted guards to ensure that the Saxon troops would remain protected from assaults by the defenders of Lenzen. So this is like a, uh, a calm, like it, it shows how organized the Saxons were, how they weren't losing their hand. Um, and they were doing everything methodically, like they were habituated given their substantial military activity uh, in the era. The Saxons also post some sort of scouts, right? Because they're not simply guards or, or sentinels. Uh, they're known as custodes exercitum, which in this sense means those who, you know, guard the army, but in a, in a broader sense, right? But the antemne. Uh, of, of of the Saxon force with the specific task of warning in fact of any effort to relieve the defenders which the Slavs were in fact up to on the fifth day of the siege so uh, quite early on September the 3rd the Saxon scouts report uh, to the to their commanders, the large Slavic force was uh, located nearby. They also reported that Slavs uh, planned a night attack on the fortified Saxon camp. Uh, so the Vidukins tells us uh, literally, at quia nocte contigua impetum in castra facere descrivissent. So literally, they, they wanted to, to make this assault. At night, says Eadem ora collega dic dictante precepit, ut per totam noctem parati essent, ne qua forte irruptio barbarorum in castra fiere. So that the, the Saxon commanders ordered uh, their troops to be ready in that specific night to withstand this uh, wild. Um, Barbaric literally says uh, assault. The Saxons again, uh, excuse me, the, the Slavs were, as we were saying before, famous because of their defensive capacities. But these, um, say, sh literally shady moves at night um, with sudden assaults, right, hoping the enemy uh, to uh, to have to, to have their guard lowered, etc. Just per se, tell us that they didn't really were not really keen on. In meeting the Saxons in open field, and they would hope that um, their evident uh, inferiority at this point could be um, um, compensated uh, by a, a surprise attack of some sort. Right? How this custodes exercitum uh, learned of the Slavic plans? We do not know. Probably they weren't mere scouts. Right, they had some force with them. They captured um, some some Slavs. Some of them could have simply uh, defected to to the Germans. Uh, in any case, we, we can imagine torture being habitually practiced to to extort the information. In any case, this was uh, the case. Um, and uh, early the next morning, we are on September the 4th. In fact, the Slavs did draw themselves up in an infantry phalanx, which was their general modus operandi, especially in this northern area. Telling the truth, the Bohemians, the Poles, especially, had substantial cavalry bodies, like a lot. Like It's been estimated but by the 11th century, one-third of the Polish army was mounted, right? But in, in this north, like in some of the these are very poor areas, even for for Slavic standards. The Slavs here were scarcely stratified from a social point of view. The terrain, as we will see now, was just not well suited in, in this specific place, by the way, uh, for cavalry. So um, the bulk of the the freemen of the say of the uh, of, of the able-bodied of the, whichever levy, surely uh, this force was made up. Right, uh, drew in in a in a quite strong infantry phalanx. It also, we will see in uh, in open field, 
did have a uh, defensive function still but could still face the um, the Saxons with some success um, so this this infantry phalanx um, draws up um, opposite the Saxon siege camp Bernard draws up his own infantry to face the Slavic forces um, so this is just like a bit of a pitched battle um, because uh, the, the Saxons have come out of the of the of the settlement even at least something went uh, differently from what um, say the the surprise attack would have gone like so here the Slavs were challenging the Germans to, to come out and fight in one or another because um, if it was difficult for them say to 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 as we will see now to to con to fight the the Germans in in defensive you, you you can imagine in in offensive against a fortified entrenchment uniquely they they had by now already uh, say lost the possibility of attacking at night if they had planned it um, and if they had thought that they could do it by surprise so we do not know their side of the story but these are the seem to be the options um, and there is, um, uh, like, these battles were fought in normally with the, the infantry lines confronting each other um, and occasionally going back and forth, like meeting right in a, either on the middle ground or one advancing and retreating, whatever. At this point, Bernard sends a mounted force of Equitas, which um, do not necessarily correspond to heavy cavalry but maybe some skirmishers to pepper the enemy lines to, to test them where of course it was surely a shock element every cavalry has um, surely we don't have to necessarily think them as only um, shock or missile force it would be uh, a mistake and Vidokin says that from this uh, first test would surely did entail an exchange of favors like of, of darts, missiles, the, the Slavs, uh, like we, where we have the, the heavy infantry you know, you know, in, in the battle line you have lighter troops that run kind of uh, jump around in, in the front, withdraw within the, if there is any um, of course there is because this is a substantial force, there are gaps between the various units, uh, the various subunits, uh, and um, keep harassing the enemy as soon as uh, it approaches. Uh, as much as they send troops, uh, surely to to harass the enemy as well. But we, especially with the German cavalry around, uh, the slider troops are not comfortable, right? Um, in any case, we are in a time in the art of war in which cavalry doesn't have clearly the uh, decisive, let's say, the unchallenged um, uh, superiority, right? Uh, the uh, the Saxon infantry had managed to crush Carinjan cavalry at Zuntel in 782, uh, not very far from these places, uh, in a in a general sense. Um, the uh, the sense was that cavalry definitely had uh, already. Uh, the upper hand uh, on the battlefield in early medieval times, but um, a courageous uh, infantry could defend successfully uh, against it, right? Uh, absorb the impact of the enemy cavalry and, and butcher it down or oblige it to, to retreat. Um, and this situation was quite complex because it does seem that the Slavs. Um, had um, uh, you know gather a substantial amount of forces. By the way, these may have been the same uh, that um, uh, the same ones that had been sent at Valsleben that had uh, moved because it, it's difficult to think that this was a, just a different army from the same Redarians, right? So it's possible that they left somebody to besiege. Um, Vasleben, 
and that the, the main body withdrew across the Elbe to, um, to rescue Lenzen from the Saxon siege that had simply been the proof that the Saxons were not particularly worried about the same Valsleben in that sense, so that, generally speaking, they did have the, uh, the upper hand as a, as a general force in spite of the initiative taken apparently by surprise by, by Slavs uh, from a strategic point of view at the beginning of the summer uh, campaign. But going back on the battlefield at Lenzen, um, the, um, the, the main problem for the Germans was that the ground was too wet for the mounted soldiers to maneuver properly, Vidukin says. Right, so trying to lure out the Slavs uh, of their phalanx using uh, even tactics of feigned retreat um, were unsuccessful. Right, and um, the solicity of their phalanx was not simply. Uh, destroyable through uh, a massive cavalry charge because uh, the ground was really not suited for it. Right? This is fascinating because immediately cavalry was there but we do not know whether the, the militas had... Um, surely they, they were waiting, right? Normally they, they, they were uh, just uh, sometimes abandoning, like dismounting um, and even resting during times of the battle, because at least you had these two blocks. Uh, the Slavs seem to have a, mostly a defensive attitude. Surely um, the situation is quite tense, and the militants have to uh, to be able to 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 intervene on horseback as well. Um, but the ground uh, across the terrain is really uh, unsuited. So what Bernard decides to do was launching a series of attacks against the Slavic phalanx with his own phalanx of uh, Saxon uh, foot soldiers. Um, this would be like bloody, but at least it was the best way to punch frontally the Slavs and, and seeing if it was possible into uh, melee to break the Slavic formation, which instead resisted, causing, by the way, heavy losses on both sides, right? And uh, Thietmar of Merseburg, uh, in his later chronicle, says that uh, two of his great grandfathers died in this specific engagement, which is fascinating because. Um, of just of the origins in this case of, of the later author, but uh, you know this clash had been memorable, at least of course for even the descendants of those who had participated in it among the the foot troops that surely were handed by by the same militas, because um, normally made up the first ranks, right? So the you know here. Uh, the the brutality of the engagement is, is very heavy, right? Both sides were not kidding at all. There is also, like if we had seen the uh, the battle with our own eyes, we'd be probably surprised by how similar, right? Uh, how practically indistinguishable, aside from banners, etc., uh, the the Slavs and the Germans look right in arms and armor um, and so on. Uh, typically the Slavs pass for lesser armored and so on. It's perfectly plausible but in general like the, the balance right even just the, the more armored elite in the front and the lighter troops in the rear are uh, you know make things pretty make the odds pretty balanced in, in the quantities, etc. We're not talking about huge differences. So this engagement goes on for a consistent amount of time. Um, combat would be again reactivated intermittently after having uh, kind of reordered the ranks, having um, of course taken out the wounded, uh, brought them back, because here it seems that 
the, the Germans were marching to the Slavic position and eventually withdrawing. Um, and so even in this case, uh, it tells you that, generally speaking, they were the stronger force that had also cavalry from their side, so more options, right, compared to, to the Slavs. We do not know about them, just like where their horses were left, how much cavalry would have had on their own, but they probably chose that part of the uh, the field because they knew that uh, the the Etonians couldn't operate with cavalry in and mass with a frontal charge of the cavalry line. So this means that they probably thought themselves that to be inferior in cavalry or in in quality more likely in number um, uh, altogether. The engagement is resolved, however, in favor of the Saxon when Theatmar was able to bring his mounted troop in position to charge into the flank of the Slavic army. The Slavic phalanx is disrupted, right, and uh, its soldiers uh, begin to flee, uh, panicked, right, uh, uh, first gradually, then on, on, on mass, right, and running away. So the, the Germans managed to finally break the enemy line and to pursue it. What happened was not the magical, uh, let's say, discovery of a, of a ground uh, suitable enough for a large amount of cavalry. Uh, but rather a um, a surprise attack on the flank of some sort with fewer troops, right? Uh, you can have just a pocket of horsemen. Um, usually they have to be capable, like whoever is commanding them has to find the right time, has to move in a way not to be spotted by the enemy, etc. Of course, this attack must be coordinated with also the the advance of, of the infantry, so well, while the, the, the enemy is um, engaged frontally, so doesn't have much capacity to, uh, to change front uh, in time, which uh, at some point could have not been feasible, even if they had, depending on at least how, how soon they would, or late they would discover uh, th this force, um, this is a typical flank attack with a smaller force that doesn't even have to, to attack orderly, right? But just exploiting the devast utterly devastating psychological effect of, uh, in, of, of, of the flank attack itself, right? In the surprise, so that you're exhausted after a day of fighting. The Germans still have this cavalry. They do not know what, what to do, uh, aside from dismounting it and kind of trying try to break the enemy frontally. So they just use some of them. We're not told what path they they took. Well, likely was again a hidden maneuver, but they managed to attack the enemy in combination with their infantry and the enemy is exhausted, is freaking out. Think about the, the literal psychophysical ex exhaustion. Probably at this point, the Germans had, yes, tried to break the enemy lines, but they had also possibly um, because of this uh, advantage they may have had in quantity and in, in quality to uh, use some reserves right to tire down the enemy even though of course the the thing could end badly uh, for them until the end and to launch this fresh troops just uh, in time to make this run uh, into the enemy flank and break it. Right. So after that, uh, it's done. Right. Um, the slaughter of the Slavic relief force follows. Um, the garrison of Lenzen capitulates. By the way, so mission accomplished because the Lenzen campaign marks the second time in eight months that men of the Saxon Expeditionary Levy were dispatched to undertake siege operations, right? Um, and at Lansen, moreover, uh, the, uh, the infantry of the Saxon Levy fought uh, practically a pitched battle all day long, during which they kept their formation 
in spite of suffering heavy losses, the same was for the Slavs. Um, Bidokin says, multi inc atque in the cadenet. So the, the losses had been really considerable. So this double campaign of 929 is, is fascinating because it has, um, say, uh, first of all, it has an exemplificative value. Secondly, it shows the, the importance of all forces involved. I mean, the synergy between the militas and the, uh, the peditas, the, the levy, uh, uh, the professionals and the levy, and uh, the versatility of these forces in siege warfare, in pitch battles, in raids, etc. Right? Um, it's very important to stress here that they largely fought on foot. As you understand here, there's not properly a pitch battle with, let's say, that normal capacity of maneuver in open field. We've just uh, appreciated it. Um, so infantry here was the habitual way of, of doing so. And, you know, in, on the German battlefields until the mid-12th century, you have this as the norm. Entire armies of cavalrymen led by German kings dismounting, taking up... Uh, position behind the river. I mean, this is actually a normal thing in other times of military history. I mean, we've seen it at the Battle of Poitiers in 1356. It's much more normal than people actually would like to, to, to sell you at some point. Because it's all playing by cliché. Like, if you say, oh my god, you know, look, here these guys were smarter because they dismounted. It. And, and, and while everybody thought that warfare was about mounted troops, they were going against breaking the, the, the schemes, right? Um, uh, finding the secret solution to the battle. They did it regularly throughout all the Middle Ages. It was a, it's a completely normal thing. Um, everybody knew about it, right? Uh, in the sense, literally, even the, the, the dumbest peasant. Um, it, it, it's pure basic elementary tactics uh, doesn't uh, even require an explanation and the fact that mounted combat in some uh, circumstances was obviously more effective because you can launch these forces at enormous speed uh, with a devastating effect on on the enemy ranks so it can be provided politically socially and you would especially in the larger engagements place uh, say rely heavily on it considering this picture like it's completely normal but when you find uh, a situation in which you want to exploit at least your defensive chances it's better to dismount right even when you have cavalry yourself because at that point if you know that these troops are not uh, uh, simply going to be overrun by the uh, by the enemy forces, right? Uh, you try the advantage that defense really gives, and given that there is always somebody that must attack for strategic reasons, that the ones that make you be there on the field in the first place, you can always find yourself in the situation of dismounting or fighting against an, an enemy that that dismounts, right? So um, it's not a secret. Uh, it's not an, a magic alchemy. It's not something for military geniuses is just like the literal ABC of basic tactics, right? It, uh, there is no other way to describe this, and it's somehow cringy that um, uh, YouTube still sells the, you know, this kind of, oh my god, the, the cavalrymen were stupid to fight against infantry, as if, you know, there was a categorical form of, 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 of fighting that has always either to work or not to work, depending even just on some magical circumstances like being determined or whatever. Like, everyone who goes in, into a battle is determined enough, right? You know, it's, there is, a, 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 of course, a divide that can play the can make the thing there but let's say it's not just that small like that's a sign to, to find dismounted either than this dismount right it's not simply that right that simply follows from from the obvious circumstances but then you have still to fight the whole thing right so even this flank attack by the germans uh, at Lenzen doesn't mean that 
it would have necessarily succeeded. Doesn't mean that it could have simply called the Slavs. Uh, maybe the Slavs were trying to do the same thing uh, with the Germans. Th this actually um, would be quite common, right? I actually wrote, I'm about to write a paper to only that exemplifies this, that normally medieval chronicles uh, tell us about the success of flank attacks, uh, tell us about flank attacks only when they succeeded. You never hear like, you know, they tried this flank attack but it failed. It doesn't, I've never heard of it, like I've studied really a, 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 a large amount of battles and, and consulted a very large amount of sources, even in small engagements, that you never find a statement like this. Guess why? Because everybody used that tactics all the time. It's just that what matters is whether it succeeded or not, right? Um, so this, uh, we, we do not have more details because, of course, a Vidokind is a beautiful source and we're lucky in the first place to have this information, but um, generally speaking, like that, this is also pretty basic information. We do not know uh, everything about it. In any case, this, this was it. Right, uh, we will be talking again about this frontier because it's really important. Um, just I'm glad we managed to cover this today. So uh, now I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.